morning. Good morning. If everybody is in the foyer waiting to come on in, you are welcome to now. We are ready to start. Good morning, Facebook Live. We're going to stand and sing Lion and the Lamb. The Bible describes Jesus as the Lion of Judah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God, representing His supreme power and that He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So let's stand together. Let's sing the Lion and the Lamb as we worship together this, this morning.
could have a seat this morning. Good singing. Good morning. Good morning. We had a wonderful time last Sunday after church. Uh, all those that were able to, we got to go out to the Market Commons and uh, kids played kickball and everybody got to fellowship and uh, we had a wonderful time. We'll be doing that again uh, in the next coming weeks or so, maybe in December or just after the holidays. Uh, we'll get together again and do that. Had a wonderful time. Got to meet some new people. And uh, it was a special time. So uh, if uh, you are here for the very first time, uh, we have a care team member that will come by and uh, hand you a visitor's card. If not, I think I'll, I'll look out. I don't think it's got anybody first time. So it's good to have everybody back. And uh, welcome. Thank you for being with us on Facebook this morning. Uh, many of you decided to stay home this morning uh, after the holidays. There's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of uh, cases starting to pop back up, so appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, watch out for yourself and the well-being of others. Uh, but those of you that, co that got to come this morning, thank you so much for being here. What we're going to do, we're going to worship. We're going to still give God glory and praise, and I'm going to preach my guts out this morning, uh, just like I do every, every Sunday, and I'll be drenched in sweat in about 45 minutes. Uh, but that's what I love to do. So, uh, but we're going to be jumping into Hebrews chapter 2 this morning. I'm very excited about it. Uh, do we have any other announcements that I'm, I'm missing other than what we got coming up? Um, I do want to mention that the Creation to Christ training that we are uh, doing, that's, that one's happening December the 6th. Uh, that one is the information will be, I think, will be on the announcement uh, video, but also in the back. Uh, let's remember next to the Christmas tree out in the foyer, uh, the Hope House box and also the um, Seacoast Ministries box. We're working on that. And uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, please stop back at the back table in, of the foyer uh, where we used to serve the, uh, the food and coffee. Um, that, that's the station where you can sign a uh, we love you and uh, have a great 
season or I don't know whatever some encouragement card we got and it's going to go to uh, NHC nursing home and uh, Miss Debbie will make sure that those get to the right places uh, and uh, if you haven't got an idea of what to say just see Miss Debbie or Miss April or some of these others they'll be happy to help you out with that uh, but let's take a look at our announcements real quick and let's see what's got what we got going on in December. you came today. If you're a first time guest, we would like to offer you a small gift. So after the service, please meet one of our pastors in the welcome corner in the back. If you're joining us online, please like or subscribe and click on the connection card to let us know a little bit about yourself. Or if you have a need that you need us to pray for, we would love to hear from you. There are several ministry opportunities for you to partake in. Uh, there are donation boxes in the back with lists of items needed for two different facilities. One is Seacoast Academy, which is an in-residence home for uh, students ages 6 through 18. Also, there's New Hope, a ministry that helps homeless high school students, uh, particularly from the Myrtle Beach High School. We have blank cards in the foyer for you to write a card of blessing to one of the residents at NHC Healthcare. We believe that giving is an act of worship. There are several ways that you can give through the Tidely app, the website by mail, or you can drop it in the basket at the back of the church. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Isaiah 41.10. One of the ways that I love to learn it is just don't fear. Do not fear at all. And it has this special place for me because when we teach this to children, I've actually had children come back to me and say, oh my gosh, I had to repeat this over and over and it helped me so much. So I'm hoping this verse will help you this week if you're afraid of anything. Have a great day. Staying with us, we're going to sing Great Are You, Lord, right before Scott comes up and gives a sermon.
shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will have a seat while on the course let's sing that course one more time and if you have a child that goes to the nursery uh, this is a good time to dismiss them let's sing that last chorus together Thank you, worship team. Excellent job this morning. Thank you coming in early this morning and practicing because we were all in a turkey coma Thursday night. And uh, we could not do that then. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Mr. Fred. If you have your Bibles this morning, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to jump right back into this uh, particular part of Hebrews in our series, A Call to Faithfulness. And uh, we're really excited about it. It's been um, it's been a joy and very um, very convicting when I do the inductive study of the scriptures in Hebrews and all of the things that are involved and and uh, all the word studies and it's just pretty neat about the, how God's word is so alive and uh, you could read it forty different times and get forty different new lessons from God's Word. And that's what I love about it so much. Uh, but um, thank you again for being here this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time online, um, fill out our, our online connection card. We'd love to uh, reach out to you and uh, get to know you more. Uh, thank uh, Justin Whitney and Jordan and Colt and April. They came up yesterday and they decorated uh, for the uh, holiday season, so thank you very much for all the uh, the lights and whatever you call those things, and uh, they're beautiful. 
and uh, and the tree in the front. Thank you so much. Yes. All right. Hebrews chapter 2. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to jump right in. Y'all ready to dig this morning? Yes. Three of you are ready to go. All right. We're good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you just so much this morning for being uh, alive and well. Thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for our health. Thank you, Lord, so much that we have lungs to breathe. And that breath that we breathe is was placed there by the Creator, the one whom we serve. And we're so thankful for it. I pray this morning for many families who are uh, going through some struggles right now with the physical uh, aspect of things and uh, many who are uh, trying to get better, many that are sick. Uh, I just pray and ask that you'd have your hand of protection around it, each and every one. Be with us through these holiday seasons, Lord, that you would help us to be wise and give us discernment. But Lord, let us not f uh, falter in fear, but Lord, help us to uh, be very careful. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Hebrews. We thank you that we have no idea what man or woman wrote this particular portion of Scripture, but we're thankful that it was inspired by the Spirit of God. And Lord, for that, we are grateful. We ask that you would bless as we open it up. Help me, Lord, as I make it applicable. Lord, help me, Lord, to keep it simple and to get out of your way and allow the Spirit of God to operate. We love you this morning and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. All right, so we know from last week as we were doing our uh, opening, kind of getting it ready and gearing it up, we know that we don't know who the author is of the, uh, of the book of Hebrews. We have some ideas, we have some, uh, some speculations. Uh, we do find in Scripture some of the things that kind of give us a timeline of, of, uh, of when it was and was not written. Uh, so, but we also find that the book of Hebrews is inundated with Almost 82 Old Testament references. Uh, so that's very important. So we're going to be digging a lot through that, especially as we get into the tabernacle in uh, Hebrews and the latter chapters. Uh, we'll be digging into some of the, the original blueprints that God gave Moses. Very excited about that. One of the things that we want to look at this morning in Hebrews chapter 2 is we want to start out with the very first word of the very first verse of Hebrews chapter 2. Now what did I say when we're studying scriptures and you see the word therefore? You must go back to see what it's there for. So let's do that together this morning. So the Bible says in verse 1, therefore... We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. What did we hear? Well, let's look at it. Last week we saw in chapter 1 that the Bible gave a sevenfold description of the Son of God and Jesus Christ, the Creator of the universe. The Bible says that He was appointed the heir of all things. We believe that. We believe that through whom also Jesus created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And the Bible says he's the exact imprint or the very stamp of his nature. It also went on to say that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now we talked about that last week mostly because it was the most applicable that we could understand because we'll never understand the radiance of the glory of God. We will when we are like him and we see him as he is. But I felt like last week we really grabbed hold of this. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. We know that Jesus Christ holds it together because it started with his voice. And the Bible says that he purified the sins of the world. He makes purification for the sins because of the work of the gospel. And the Bible says in the last description that when he was done, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So that's the therefore. Since we've heard all of these things about the truth of God's word and that his power is enough, the Bible says we must pay much closer attention to what we just read. We must play, pay much closer attention to what we've just heard. Now, the words much closer attention gives us the, the idea of, of a greater degree to set our mind towards what we've just witnessed. When you've seen the truth, you cannot unsee it. The thing about the truth is it is the truth. The Bible says, 
Sanctify them through thy truth. Jesus was talking to his disciples. And he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the power of God's word that we rest on. That we see that as absolute truth. So we must, we must really dig in to what we have seen and heard. So one of the things that I heard a lot growing up in grade school was, first of all, my full name. Scott Matthew Salibi, you come here right now. When you hear your full name, then you begin to worry. Because your full name means you are about to get a whooping. Uh, that was how it was in my house. Now, I struggled in school with paying attention. My mind was on the playground. My mind was on the basketball court. My mind was elsewhere. And so it took me a long time to really learn how to focus on one thing. And to be able to just pay attention to what's being said. And so for that reason, I struggled in math. And I got real lippy, uh, very sarcastic -y. One of my spiritual gifts is sarcasm. And uh, I exercised it well in the fourth grade. And uh, where I was going to school, they didn't put up with that, especially uh, in that era. In those days, there was no time out. There was no, uh, you know, there, there was just good old-fashioned behind whooping. Good old-fashioned butt whooping. And, and, it, and it unfolded in the school system. This was when you could do that and not go to prison for whooping a kid at school. But when you got whooped at school, this is what happened. Because I would not pay attention. I would get whooped at school. And then the teacher would tell my mama, who would pick me up in the car line. And I was like, man. And then my mama would get frustrated. And then she would whoop me. I got a double dose. And then my mama would say, go to your room and wait till your father gets home. And then I would get a whooping from my dad because my mama whooped me, because my teacher whooped me, because I wouldn't pay attention. <laughs> Trifecta. It took about mm, 40 years. <laughs> and it's, it was so aggravating. So when I see the words pay close attention, the words from my teacher in math ring back in my mind, focus in, give my mind to, almost to the, to the point of to be given to an addiction. The Bible says it gives that, that, that ideology, that mindset of this word to pay attention. Prosecho, which is the Greek verb of it, to hear it. And then not just to hear it, but to put it into action. So we see in Proverbs, the Bible says in verse 31, My son, that is not to be... Uh, excluded to just a man. This is to, to man and woman, to all of creation. Do not lose sight of these things. Sound wisdom and discretion. And now notice what happens when we pay close attention to the truth of God's Word. They will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. It goes on to say in verse 23, Then you will walk on your way securely. There's not a whole lot of people in this world that are walking in security. But the Bible says, if you will do that, your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, you will sleep. Your sleep will be sweet. How many struggle in the middle of the night? You, you lay down to go to bed and your mind is constantly racing. And you have to go and get alone with the Lord for just a moment to kind of settle your spirit. And then go back to sleep. It's, it's a sweet release. It's a sweet peace, the Word of God. He says, do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. The world was stricken with fear. America was stricken in fear in 9-11. When we were all in our schools or at work and we were trying to find a television and we sat there and we watched as those towers fell and thousands and thousands of innocent lives were taken. It brought and created a great proclamation of fear. But the Bible says, do not be afraid of sudden terror. Do not allow the wicked to overcome you, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. There's nothing worse than being snagged up 
Because what happens is, what we see in these next verses, the Bible says we got to pay close attention to God's Word, the truth of it, because if we don't, we will drift away from it. From what? God's truth. We will drift away from Christ, our mediator between God and man. We will drift away from the work of the Spirit of God operating in our life. We will drift away. That word drift is, is, a, is a, a peculiar word. It, 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 gives the, it gives the idea when the writer, the ancient Greek was writing, it was given the idea of a boat. A boat out in the middle of the water. With no anchor, what does the boat need to do to drift? Absolutely nothing. It just stays there. And the current will find its way to push it to wherever it wants to go. But when we do nothing as a child of God, we will find ourselves drifting. Let me just remind us that this particular verse, this chapter, this book is written to the believer, not to the lost. So when we are securely anchored to the truth of the supremacy of Christ, we avoid drifting away from Him. I can't tell you how many times I, I would get weary in my walk. I would get weary from, from a bad report. I'd, get, I'd just get beaten down by, by the struggles and the, and, the, and the warfare and the fighting that I fight in the spiritual warfare. It's, it's wearisome. And uh, I want to take a break, and I want to rest, and I want to I want to be alone. I want to get away, and I and I find myself. There's nothing wrong with the rest that comes from God's word and the peace of knowing Him. But when we rest and then we don't do anything, we will begin to drift, drift because we're resting in our rest, not in His rest. That's why it's, it's very imperative that pastors and ministers and, and people in, in, in ministry full time, it's imperative that, that we, we take uh, seasons of rest. Because if you don't, you will burn out. But in the midst of that rest, we got to realize that we're not resting in our strength. We're not resting in getting a good night's sleep. We're not resting in, in, in taking a break from the, the, the struggles of the congregation and the people of God's people and all the things. We're resting in His rest. We're, we're secure in his, in his strength. Our anchor is not us. Our anchor is in Christ Jesus. So when we find ourselves struggling with doubt, every time in my life, when I find myself struggling with doubt and fear, look at this, it will always trace back to an area of my life that I am not trusting in the supremacy of who God is in that situation. Every single time, and I'm not an exception, it's all across the board. In our lives, when we find ourselves in fear, and, 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 and it creeps up on you so quickly. I was sharing with somebody not too long ago that the hardest part about, about being a parent isn't the actual parenting when they're small, but the challenge of faith, the trusting in Him as my anchor, comes when the kids are grown, and now they're making decisions for themselves. And I can't step in and say, this is right or this is wrong. It's none of my business. But I've got to trust in the supremacy of who God is and how they have been brought up under the truth of God's Word. And I need to be quiet and allow them to learn and grow in their walk, in their faith. Because it ain't mine, it's theirs. I find myself worrying in the midst of no, it'll just pop up. My daughter will go off to work and all of a sudden I'll have this great fear that she might get in a car accident. And something just will happen. I'd start thinking about all these horrible, fearful things. And I have to reject those things in the name of Jesus. Because that's not what God designed us to be or to live or to operate in. Because I am faulting in the supremacy of who God is. So what if she does get in a car accident? Is God still not God? 
What if we get a bad report from our child and he does not live? Does that mean that he's, he's failed in being who God is? So what if you study for a test and you've known every answer and you get under the pressure of anxiety and you, and you bomb the test and, and you get mad and things don't go your way and does that mean God failed you? Does that mean that, that God dropped the ball for you? Or are we putting God in a box saying that, that, that you've got to do this because I did this? That's not how it works. He's supreme in his, in his glory without you and I. And so the writer of Hebrews is very clear in understanding there's times in your life, there's times in my life where we struggle with doubt. Even today, even this, this year, we struggle with fear. Even today, before you came, some of us were struggling with fear. When that takes place, we need to stop. We need to take some inventory. And we need to ask this, our question, what is it about God that I'm not trusting who He is in this situation? I can trust him for the eternity of my soul in heaven, but I can't trust him for $10 to pay my water bill. Don't make sense, does it? But that's what doubt and fear does to us. It, it, it makes us stupid. It creates, it creates uh, uh, something that doesn't make sense. Things that don't add up. And so we got to understand that. Now, the Bible says in verse 2, For since the message declared by angels... Stop. Before we go any farther, I want to make sure that we understand what the author is trying to get across to us. What the author is saying to us is that the angels of God were responsible and had a part in giving Moses the law. The Bible says in Acts chapter 7 verse 53, Stephen is preaching his last sermon. Why is it his last sermon? Because he's about to become a, a martyr for the cause of Christ. He's about to be stoned by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people who were saying that he was the opposite of what they, what they were saying he was. He was there to say, you don't need the law anymore. Jesus Christ came to defy the law. And it's, and it's the work of the gospel. And the Bible says that they hated him so much that they began to gnash their teeth and they began to seethe. And they grabbed him up and they threw him in a hole outside the city and they threw giant stones at him. The Bible says that his face looked like the face of an angel. He had the Spirit of God on him so dearly that, that, that he even said the same words that Jesus said when he was on the cross, Father, do not lay this sin to their charge. And so the Bible says in Acts 7, 53, says, You who received the law... As delivered by angels and did not keep it. You couldn't even keep the law. And so what do we see here? The Bible says, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, but every transgression, what is a transgression? Is a violation that has been broken. Or a disobedience received a just retribution. They're saying that the law was something that was serious and it demanded to be taken serious. But what we find here is that although the law had, was a demand to be taken seriously, the Hebrew writer here is saying that just because it was taken seriously does not mean that we ought to negate that what Jesus said should be taken even more seriously. Let me read this. It says this right here in my notes. This, this law was demanded to be treated seriously. If we must take the word delivered by angels, the law, seriously, then the word that came by the way of the Lamb of God must be taken even more seriously. Because Jesus is greater than the angels in every way. So his message should be regarded as greater. I wrote this. Uh, as a note, a greater word brought by a greater person having greater promises will bring greater condemnation if it is neglected. Now what do we find here in verse 3? The Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The writer's asking that question to me and to you today. See, one of the things that, that I struggle with in this verse was the word neglect. 
If this verse, this, this passage, this book is written to the Christian, the discouraged Christian who is struggling in their fight with their walk with the Lord and is just struggling with their, um, with, their, with their walk and being encouraged in the faith, but to carry on with Christ Jesus, knowing who He said. So if we're neglecting, the word neglect is a powerful word. It means to have the opportunity, but to disregard it. I'm going to neglect the, the offer. I see it there. It's in front of me. I can reach out and take it, but I decide I'm not going to use it. I'm going I'm to I'm reject it. Neglecting is, is something that happens in the Christian life who has found themselves doing nothing and just drifting in the middle of nowhere. And before you know it, it's not a sudden impact. It's, a, it's over a period of time. We've, we've done nothing for so long that we drift and we look around and there's no land to be seen. And it's a struggle. And so the Bible said it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard. But to neglect salvation. I want to park here for just a second. To neglect salvation is simply to make light of it. Now where are you going with this, Pastor? Well, hang tight with me for a second and, and, and understand my thought here. It is written primarily to us. Not only that, but when we disregard God's Word, it means we can take it or leave it. And when it is not considered great to us, we leave it up to convenience instead of commitment. Now, that, that really hit me pretty hard. Because there's a lot of things that we take for granted in this free country that we live in. Our freedom to worship. Our freedom to come to a service without fear of being shot as we walk through the door. We don't have to sneak around and have secret church. We are free to get in our vehicles and come to the house of God and worship as an assembly together as a body of Christ. But we neglect God's word, the truth of it, the salvation that comes. We got to understand that when we neglect it, we leave it up to convenient. If it's convenient. Look, when I planted the church, one of the things that I was bombarded with was statistics. And I'm not a big stat guy unless it's sports. But one of the things that stood out to me most was this, this gigantic book of, so you want to plant a church. And it wasn't written by anybody that anybody knows. It was just... Just kind of thrown together some ideas of some guys that, that had planted multiple churches all across the world. And one of the things that they said in America, only place ever, that people will, there's a certain amount of stoplights that would be considered inconvenient for someone to not get up on a Sunday and come to worship with someone else. Stoplights. To be, to be more accurate, they said that, you, you know, most Americans will not go through 11 stoplights that would keep them from coming to the house of God. Convenience instead of commitment. How is it that we find ourselves in this place as a child of God or we are drifting and we don't even realize it? We... One of the things that, that I remember very carefully in my own life was growing up, I was always taught uh, to give a portion of your giving to the Lord, not because He needs it, but because it is as an attribute to obeying Him because of where it came from. And also the second one was to be in the house of God. Now that seems kind of uh, elementary, but... One of the things that my dad sat me down, my mom, and said, when you begin to get a job, you're going to want a car. You're going to want to get a job to pay for that car. 
And then before you know it, you're going to be asked to work on this particular day of the week. And that particular day happens to be the day that, that I've committed to, to honor the Lord and be in the house of God. Not for me, but that I might operate in my gifting and serve the body. And so the first thing that goes when we find ourselves drifting is we, we quit coming to church. Now, I'm not pointing fingers to anybody. If you don't like this, that's not my problem. That's between you and the Lord. I don't know who you are. I don't keep up with it. But I'm just saying, the first sign of drifting is that people stop coming to the house of God. It's not something I just discovered. It's been happening since church started. And one of the things that, that will, especially if it's a man, that he comes to Christ, I sit him down, I said, man, that's an amazing decision. But let me tell you, two things are about to happen. And they say, what? He says, oh, I'm not a prophet. I just see this all the time. And here's what's going to happen. Either you're going to find a, a, a relationship with a woman and she's going to pull you away from the house of God or you're going to get a promotion and a job every time. And it's not just men, it's women too. It's anybody who's made a commitment to the truth of God's Word. And then we neglect. And before you know it, we're out of church. And before you know it, we're out of touch with the body of Christ. And before you know it, we're not operating in how God designed us to live. And that is to serve the body of Christ. Why do I push this? Because I can't do it by myself. I came from a church where the whole mentality was that everybody thought the preacher should do it all. And it kind of it kind of bothered me for a little while. And then when I started seeing that we were going through like four and five and six pastors in ten years, that something wasn't right. Well, it was the culture of the people. And so we got to find that drifting isn't just individually, it's church-wide as well. And so we got to understand when we disregard that, we're looking at it as a, as a convenience. Uh, it's, it should not be convenient. for If you're not fighting to get to the house of God on a Sunday morning, then there's probably some areas where we need to probably look at what's going on. If your refrigerator doesn't blow up on occasion right before church, or your dog starts to have some kind of exorcist vomiting spell, or, or your baby gets crazy and starts throwing knives at you, or, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Your, your washer, I mean, I've heard it all. When's it happen? Right before you get ready to go to church. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want the people of God to operate in their gifting. It's not convenient when you walk out to take your dog to use the bathroom on Sunday morning. The dog decides to eat the face off of another little dog next door to you. That ain't normal. It couldn't happen on a Friday. It couldn't happen on a Saturday. It has to happen on a Sunday morning. Amen? It's crazy. Everything will work fine on a Sunday morning. You get to church on Sunday morning and the system is just satanically possessed. What do we do? Do we shut it down say, this isn't convenient, we're just going to stop? No, we're going to keep pushing on. We're going to keep moving forward. Why? Because it's got to cost us something in order for us to appreciate it. And so it's, an, it's very vital that we understand that. So how should we neglect such a great salvation? The Bible says it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard. Now when you read verse 3, this kind of gives us an indication that this person that wrote this particular uh, portion of Hebrews was not a first generation Christian. Meaning he was not somebody that was with Jesus at the time of his, uh, of, of his life on earth. Why? Because it said it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard. Meaning it was given, it was handed down. So that's a good idea. When you read the scriptures, you see that it's a possibility of when it was not written. It was written maybe in the second generation of the church. And then verse 4 says, While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to His will. One of the signs of a drifting church is a church that tries to manufacture the Spirit of God. Amen. It can't happen. You can get all kinds of smoke machines, which I'm not against them, but you can get them all up there. We could be floating around in some misty blue glow. That ain't going to summon up nothing. Amen. It's the 
preaching and the power of the word of God. And so we got to be very mindful of that as we move forward in 2021. So glad to say that. <laughs> that we are walking in His strength and not our own. So Christians neglecting so great a salvation because they never see it as salvation. Now, now notice what I'm saying here. We find ourselves neglecting salvation because we're not looking at it as salvation. We see it merely as receiving something instead of being rescued from something. I had to do a I had to do a gut check here when I, when I read this, when I began to see this in Scripture, when I, when I saw this. There was a time in my life where I saw salvation as it was finished when I came to Christ and it was over. I'm in. I'm good. But what we got to understand is that the gospel is not just for salvation. The gospel is for after we come to Christ and the power of the gospel is for our walk as we sanctify by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't stop at the cross. It continues to move forward in His strength. But do you see it this morning as merely receiving something? Or do you see it as you were lost in your sin? You were struggling and drowning in your, in your, in your life? And I, there, it depends on who it is. When I, when I share the gospel with people, it depends on their makeup, their character, uh, their personality, but a lot of times, if it's somebody that can handle it, I will, I will start off with, you were born an enemy of God. According to the scriptures, without Christ, the Bible says we're born an enemy of God. And that when God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross, He literally poured His wrath onto Himself in His Son Jesus Christ. So that it could appease a holy God. And that when he sees us at the cross, covered by the blood of Jesus, through repentance of our sin, we find ourselves and we see ourselves rescued. Rescued from eternal hell. Because of who he is. Because of who he is. God didn't create hell for us. It was not designed for us. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. But because there can be no sin even close to a holy God. Those who reject Jesus Christ will find themselves in a Christless eternity. A place called hell where the worm does not die. I believe in a real hell. This church believes in a real hell. And we believe in a heaven. A heaven where God is designed. And he's even there now in his son Jesus interceding for us on the throne. And the Bible says that Stephen looked up and saw Jesus. He wasn't sitting. He was standing at the right hand of the throne of God. What makes you think he was, he was standing? Because the word of God says he was standing. What well, makes you think he was standing? Well, the Bible says he was standing, but the Bible says in, in Hebrews 1 that he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. But when he sees the saints of his people uh, giving him glory and being operated in the, the, the presence of the Spirit of God, is it possible that the, the, the Son of God stands for the saints of those who are sacrificing their life for the, call of, for the cause of Christ? Where are we? Have we neglected so great a salvation? Have we decided this is just a tradition here in the South? I'm just going to go to church and be done with it. And I'm going to bring home the bacon and my wife's going to raise the kids. And that's all it's going to be? Mm -mm, no. You're broken. You're broken if that's how you think. We worship. We serve. We sacrifice for one another. And we give God glory. Look, lost people are serving others. And I see a lot of people that don't know that know Christ who have neglected so great a salvation, they're sitting on their church attendance, they're sitting on their on their bank account, they're sitting on their I'm a good person. And it's it scares me. It ought to wake us up. Am I drifting? 
as the Hebrew writer said, am I finding myself so far from land, the truth, that I can't see straight? Have I been indoctrinated by the philosophy of the world that, 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 that I found the Word of God to be secondary in my life? So, as we, as we go about our week this week, my question to you is this. Are you one who's drifting? Have you found yourself as salvation is just receiving something? Yes, man, when I was three years old, I prayed this prayer and I got saved. Has there been a change? Has there been a, has there been a transformation in your life? Is there fruit in your life? Is there growth? Or are you, are you, are you banking on something you did at three and then nothing has produced an opportunity for your life to bring glory to God? I'm not trying to convince you that you're saved or lost. I'm giving you the truth of God's Word. If it sounds awkward, it's because you've drifted away from it. It sounds a little different. Do we see it merely as receiving something? Or are you on a, on a regular, finding yourself on your knees, thanking the Lord for bringing you this far? I look out and I see, I see amazing people. I see good people. I see hard working people. But if we were to muster up all of our good. All of our good deeds. There is none righteous. No not one. Where are we this morning in our walk with Him? Have we found ourselves in the middle of the sea of neglect? Or have we anchored our spirit and we anchored our life to the truth of God's Word? And our biggest struggle is to encourage everybody else. Or are you the one that needs constant reminding? Let's get back to the truth of God's Word. Let's allow the Spirit of God to... To do Christians. I'm talking to believers this morning. When's the last time we wept over someone lost without Christ? When's the last time we've wept alone with the Lord at the goodness of what He's done for us? When's the last time we've, we've shed a tear because someone came to Christ? Someone that you did not expect to ever take it serious enough. When's the last time you've seen a change in someone who was being brought from darkness to light? Have we neglected it? Have we, have we pushed it aside and allowed stuff to blind us from the great salvation that comes from Him? So I think I'll stop right there this morning. Uh, worship team, if you'll come, they're going to sing a new song called Brokenness Aside. This song is is kind of indicative of the, of the sermon this morning. There's a lot of things that we can get excited about. Look, I, I get excited about college football. I get excited about sports. I mean, that's just my makeup. It's the way God designed me. I love it. But, but do I find myself getting excited about things that, that matter? Football game doesn't matter. In light of eternity, ain't nobody going to remember a silly game. Ain't nobody going to remember... A special singer. The king of pop's dead. The king of rock and roll's dead. Everybody's a, trying to, to reach that next level. I want to anchor my, my life to the truth of God's word. When the 9-11's happen and when the corona happens and when all these things. Look, th if you think this is the last of, of shock and awe in this world, you, you're sadly mistaken. It's more coming. But I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about it because I'm anchored to Him. Now, where are you this morning? Let's stand to our feet and let's worship together this song. Listen to them as they sing. And let's ask ourselves this morning as we, by way of invitation, let's ask ourselves, have I found myself neglecting so great a salvation? Will your grace run out and let you It's all I know is how to run. Inside.
ways to find yourself not drifting a a good way to find yourself not neglecting so great a salvation is to remind yourself on the regular you know how you can remind yourself by sharing the gospel when you find yourself sharing the gospel of the testimony of what God's done for your life and where you've come from And how he brought you out of where you came from. We all came from a sin sick broken world. But the work of the the cross. the, The work of the gospel. To take the brokenness that we had. Now we no longer live in that brokenness. Because we are a child of the king. We are a joint heir with Christ. Who is the heir of this world. And we walk around in freedom. But we live like we're still enslaved. I want our life to represent that as a body of Christ. I want our life to represent that as a, as a business owner, as an employee, as a, as a parent, as a child, as a, as, a, as a family member. That we will not neglect the truth of God's word. And that we will hold true it, hold true to it and dear to it because of, of who he is. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for your word I pray that you'd have your hand upon us, Lord, this week as we go about our week this week. I pray that you would help us in in our struggles, Lord, when doubt arises, when fear knocks at our door. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to rest in who you are and to be reminded of your promises, the truth of your word, that we will saturate our heart and our spirit with it, that we will hide our heart. Uh, our, our, the, thy word in our heart that, that we might not sin against you. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to find ourselves being intentional in spending time with you and to find ourselves in these last uh, moments of this year to get closer to you in our walk with you. Not that we need to attain to something greater, but, Lord, that you have done the work on the cross. You have finished it. 
And Lord, we are free, not because of our deeds, not because of our work or any effort that we have put forth, but because of Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for that this morning. We ask that you would watch over us this week. Be with us. Help us, Lord, to to function and to operate as a victorious, victorious Christian this week. We love you this morning. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.